talk about squirrels this morning. The church is in the cozy little town called Happyville. We're plagued with a squirrel infestation. And the various churches each took their respective approaches to ridding themselves of these beasts. The Presbyterian Church called a meeting to decide what to do about this squirrel problem. After much prayer and consideration, they concluded that the squirrels were predestined to be there and they should not mess with them. <laughs> now the Baptist, on the other hand, when the squirrels seemed to take an interest in their baptistry, the deacons met and decided to put a water slide into the baptistry. And thus the squirrels would slide down the water slide and drown. What they found out was that the squirrels enjoyed it so much that they invited all their friends to the pool party. Now the Lutheran church, now they took an interesting approach. They decided that they were not in a position to harm any of God's creatures. So they humbly, humanely trapped their squirrels and then set them free near to the Baptist church. <laughs> Two weeks later, <laughs> the squirrels were back when they found that the Baptist had taken down the water slide. Now, the Methodist folks, they desiring to instruct these squirrels in the Word of God, as Methodists want to, hoping that the knowledge that these squirrels would gain would cause them to depart from their wicked ways. They gave up in despair, though, when they discovered that none of the beasts could read. Now, the Pentecostals, they welcomed the squirrels into fellowship, but soon became sorely disappointed when they discovered that these noisy little varmints weren't actually speaking in tongues. <laughs> now, the Episcopalians tried a very different approach. They decided they were going to set out pans of whiskey around the church in an effort to killed the squirrels with alcohol poisoning. Sadly, they learned the severe damage that drunken squirrels can do. <laughs> now, the Catholic Church came up with a more creative strategy. They simply baptized all the squirrels and into the church and made them members. <laughs> then all they would see is the squirrels would come on Christmas and Easter. <laughs> you know, not much was heard from the Jewish synagogue. They took the first squirrel and circumcised him, and <laughs> they never saw another squirrel from that point on. <laughs> Now, I know this is this was an informative thing for you, so now you understand. I saw that. I just had to share it. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead and pull up my screen there, sir. Your victorious life in Christ Jesus. Now last, uh, that, that notwithstanding squirrels, of course. I really hate those little varmints. In fact, we had to have Brother Paul come to our house a year or two ago after the squirrels destroyed part of our eaves and different things, trying to get inside the house. So I'm, I'm an arvent enemy of squirrels. Hmm? Put out rat poisoning. We put, yeah, we don't want to talk about that. It, <laughs> that's the word of faith, folks. They'll put out the rat, <laughs> rat poisoning. Yeah, it's illegal. <laughs> <laughs> All righty, next screen. So first, 
1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57. Read this with me. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we know that we are in the world, but we're not of the world, don't we? That's what we're told. Now being in the world, the consequences of that is that there are still tribulations that we're going to face. There are still things that are going to come against us because we have an enemy that hates with, with a passion. And by the way, for his information, I'd respond accordingly and hate him with a passion. And the good news is that I found that I have authority over him. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. So it is the will of God, and I want you to hear me, it is the will of God that we always walk in victory in our lives. Amen. That is not to say you won't be tested. That's not to say that you won't be attacked. But with every one of those attacks, there's going to come victory. And if you think about it, when the Lord tells us in Scripture that this, He uses the word victory or victorious, there's an implication that before you're going to have victory, there's got to be a, a battle. Right. You, you understand? You don't have no victory without a battle. So when those battles come, not if, but when, you can be assured that there's something in the mind of God that has already set in place for you the victory that you need. That's right. Amen. Now, if you'll recall, last week we talked about the principle of silver platter. You remember that? And I immediately took you to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, that tells us that we have been given all things. Say that with me, all things. All things that pertain to life and to godliness. All things that pertain to life, that's this life, and godliness are the spiritual things. So everything is already in place. That's why we're always going to have victory. Next screen. Now here's your keys, write these down. Today I'm just going to deal with number one. We're going to deal with the others in future, future uh, teachings. Number one, we gotta focus on today. Focus on today, don't look back. Let God take care of the tomorrows. Focus on today. Number two, you have an, a, a mandate to grow in knowledge, knowledge of the Word of God. Yeah. Now you remember Jesus teaches us something. He says now, to whom much is given, what does he tell us? Much is required. Much is required. Mm -hmm. So as we grow, it's kind of like us parents when we're raising our children. What you expect of a three-year-old is much different than what you expect of a 13-year-old right. or of a 23-year-old, yeah. right? So the Lord requires us to grow in knowledge and to mature spiritually because as we do that, we're going to find those, those battles and those attacks will, will have less and less effect on us because we have the knowledge of God's Word. So the second thing is that we have to have knowledge. We have to be growing in that knowledge. Now the third step is this. You've got to practice your faith. I want you to say that word with me, practice. practice. What does practice mean? It means repetitively and constantly you are doing what you need to be doing. Yes. Faith is an act. Yes, it is. Faith is. Okay? Faith is an act. Yes. You might have faith in your heart, but if you won't move out and begin to exercise that, it does nothing for you. That's right. See, so faith is an act. So make sure that you're practicing your faith. Yes. Now, number four, develop a kingdom mindset. Yes. Now, let's, let's look back on our individual lives for just a moment. Yes. You're born, you go through the little bitty, you know, the gurgling stage and chewing on your thumbs and all the rest of that, but you grow. <laughs> we're hoping we're not still doing that, right? right. And you continue to grow and mature. And as you do, you begin to, your focus begins to widen, doesn't it? 
Now, if you're around a two or three year old, what's the one thing and the only thing they're thinking about? Themselves. Themselves, that's right. How does it impact me? Am I hungry? Do I want new toys? Do I want mama's attention? The dog just bothered me, so I'm going to scream. You know, everything's about me, right? Boy, that sounds a little bit like some Christians I know. Let me think about that a minute. Hmm. The kingdom mindset is that you begin to understand your place in a wider and broader environment, a spiritual environment called the kingdom of God. And you and I have responsibility for each other. Right? I remember when I was growing up, I, was, I don't know, I was probably about five or six, seven years, probably six, seven years old, and my mother informed me that I was going to begin to have my turn at washing dishes. Oh, yeah. We didn't have dishwashers in those days. Amen. Well, that was below me. <laughs> I'm not a dishwasher. Of course, she didn't care what I thought. Amen. She made me a dishwasher. And one of the things that she's trying to sell me on the idea with is that I'm serving our family. Well, I was, wasn't I? I was, I was being a, a part of the, the operations of our family. Yeah. Well, see, Christians need to understand that as well, mm -hmm. even at the local church level. See, the local church is actually the building block of the kingdom of God. It's the smaller unit, isn't it? Yeah. Well, when we come together as a church family, we have a responsibility to accept one another, Amen. to forgive one another, right. yes. to carry each other's burdens and give preference to one another. Amen. See, all of those are biblical mandates that God gives to us, right? right? And as we perform those, it strengthens this local church. Amen. And as this local church is strong, the kingdom of God becomes stronger, Amen. right? See, this is one thing when I'm, when, I'm doing, when I'm training and teaching our pastors in other nations. Mm -hmm. I remember I was, I was ministering in, uh, in East Africa, and we ha I had probably, I don't know, there was probably about three or 400 pastors and ministers there. And uh, I asked them, I said, what, uh, what's the emphasis in your church? And the, several of them, you know, began to give me responses. But the one thing that I did not hear was them having that corporate mindset. Do you understand what I'm saying there? The, the, the people were concerned about themselves. They needed, they needed to have their bills paid. They needed to have healing. And all of those are legitimate things that God is concerned about. So there's nothing wrong with that. But we don't stop there. Your Christianity is not about you. Do you know that? That's right. That's good. Hmm. Kingdom mindset. Say it with me. A kingdom mindset. Kingdom mindset says, I want to see God's kingdom advance. So I'm, I'm teaching these pastors sitting there. I'm saying, get that mindset beyond your church. It's not about building your church. It's about serving God by serving people, and then your church will grow. Then you will see God fulfill the plan and vision that he has for your church. So that's what I say to us here at Riverside. Let's, let's keep the kingdom mindset and not get focused on ourselves. God's got some plans for this church, folks. Don't be limited by what you see right now. Okay? Mm -mm -mm. Number five, what is it? Dominate your enemy. Pull up Luke chapter 10, verse 19, if you would, Brother Jason. I want us to look at this truth. I still hear people say, oh man, I can't, I just hope the devil doesn't mess with me. The devil should be saying, I hope he doesn't mess with me. Luke 10, 19, Behold, I give you what? Authority. What's that mean? What authority? What's that mean? The right to rule. Yes. The one who's in charge. That's right. That's right. Behold, I. Who's the I? That's 
God, God is speaking to his people. I have given to you the authority. He says the authority to do what? Trample on serpents and scorpions? Is he talking about snakes and bugs? No, 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 no. Those are metaphors for spiritual beings, demonic powers, demons. So trample on serpents and scorpions and over what? All of the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. I tell you what, that ought to light your fire. We have no fear of Satan. He is under our feet. So you have to dominate your enemy. Now one of the things that we had a football coach that uh, um, understood a dynamic that he finally got across to us. And that was this, that you don't score on defense. Now, I was primarily a defensive player, okay? That was my specialty. Well, there are many times when I would intercept a pass and then I'd make a touchdown. So I scored. I was a defensive man and I scored, right? Yeah. Now, there was one interesting dynamic. The, the instant I had that ball in my hand, I don't care if they call me defensive or not. Right. Suddenly, I was the hit he instead of the hit whore. Yes. Mm-hmm. Wait, you understand? All of a sudden now, I'm doing, I'm taking that initiative. I'm needing to get over that goal line. There's 11 other guys that don't want me to get there. So I must have that offensive mindset. Even as a defensive player, he built into us, have that mindset that you're going to score. Saints, listen to me. You and I must not wait till we're attacked to go looking for the devil. Yes. That's right. Some people say, what? Man, let's keep a low profile and hope he forgets about us. <laughs> this is just a guess, but I bet he doesn't forget about you. So what does it mean to be offensive? What does it mean to be on offense spiritually? Let me tell you what I do. You, you can figure it out yourself or whatever God shows you. But every morning, I set the enemy on notice That's right. that he has no rights to me or my family. That's right. yeah. I set the line in the sands that you're not going to cross this line. Amen. Now, what gives me the right to do that? The authority, the authority yes. And that authority is based on a promise, and that promise comes from Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. In fact, pull that up. I want your eyes to see this. Genesis 15, 1. I want you to see it. This is when God is beginning to develop the concept of covenant with Abraham. And here is what he told Abraham. You got it there for me? Genesis 15, 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. He did not say, I will provide a shield for you, Abram. He says, I'm going to be your shield. Now, who's talking there? Almighty God himself, Jehovah, creator of the heavens and earth. And when he gets between you and the enemy as your shield, well, guess what? There is no way in the world a created being, which Satan is, can can move beyond the will of God that you have given him the right to stand there because of your faith. Do you understand? The promise is I'll be your shield. But I told you last week that you've got to implement faith in order for that promise to be actuated. So when you are on offense, the enemy is on his heels. He's not not ready to do that attacking mode. He's running. What does it say? Resist the devil and what will he do? He will flee from you. 
we got to get that in our minds. You set your stage. You set your world every day so that the evil one does not have an opportunity to bring his stealing, killing, and destruction that he says that he's going to do. Say amen with me. Next screen, Jason. Let's focus on today now. Shall we do that? Now, why am I going to talk about today? Why not yesterday? Why not tomorrow? When God creates a unit of time, we call it a day. And he sets that in place. And he has a plan for that day. He has a plan for that day. There's something in his, in his mind that everything on the earth is supposed to operate in such a way today. Now here's our problem. We human beings, we tend to feel the effects and look backward at what we regret, the mistakes we've made, or maybe even the good things, maybe the victories. Maybe we live in the past, be all the good things that we've seen, but nonetheless, when you've got got this focus back here, everything stops in your today. Everything stops. My granddaddy, back in the old days, had this, some of you maybe will remember, has a big round wheel, a pair of handlebars, and a single plow. Okay? And you push this thing, and it makes a furrow so that you can plant your garden. Okay? Now, I love to play with this thing. Now, one time when I got about seven, eight years old, kind of strong enough to push the thing where it would even go in the ground. Grandpa was allowing me to help him plant his garden. So I'm out there and I'm giving it one of these, you know, and just straining for all I could do. And I got distracted by something over here, but I kept pushing. Guess what happens? (laughs) Now, my granddaddy was close to a perfectionist. He wanted that, that row exactly perfect. Well, all of a sudden, a little old Randy, his row went like this. Uh-oh. Unacceptable. Right. Actually, Jesus gives us a principle about that very thing. You know that? Mm-hmm. He says for the guy that sets his hand to the plow and then looks back, what does he do with the plow? He says he's not fit for the kingdom of God. Not fit? In other words, his, his effectiveness in the things of God diminishes. And the longer he has, he has his focus back here, the longer everything stops in his life. I found out one thing as a counselor years ago as, as, when I came into pastoral ministry that oftentimes, I would say even the majority of time, People, one of the problems at least that people were having was looking backward with regrets and disappointments, guilt. See, any one of us can understand those things, can we not? Anybody here got some regrets about your life? Got some mistakes and sins? Ooh. (laughs) Now, I know Phil doesn't have any, but the rest of us, you know, we've all... Got, to, got some of those in our song. <laughs> when you focus on yesterday, you have ceased to operate in the will of God and his plan will not happen. So the longer you stay in yesterday, the less likely you are to please God and to fulfill what he has for your life. Your yesterday is gone. You cannot change a thing about it. And God doesn't want you to even consider it. You remember what we dealt with last week? I told you there's going to come a reckoning time when you stand before the Lord about your life. Remember that? 
And he's going to look at all the good things that you did and give you rewards, and he's going to find that you didn't do anything bad on his records. That's right. So why would you worry about it? Anybody remember what Romans 8 1 says? Pull up Romans 8 1. Because every one of us has a history or has a past, and some of that history of past and mistakes was just 12 minutes ago. <laughs> there is therefore now no condemnation, no guilt, no judgment against you. No condemnation to who? Say it with me. I'm in Christ Jesus. Say it again. I'm in Christ Jesus. So there's no condemnation to you. Your past isn't worth a flip. Neither is mine. Let's quit focusing on it. These people don't walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. We're spiritual beings once we're born of the Spirit, are we not? So let's don't limit ourselves to our humanity. Let's remember that we are in Christ Jesus, new children called by his name. Hallelujah. Go to that next screen, if you would, please. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain heaven, rain bread from heaven for you. And everybody goes, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day. Comma, that I may test them. What happens when someone a little fearful of whether or not the man is going to show up the next day, what happens when they get a little extra? Not much, just a little extra. Start stinking and get worms in it. Why doesn't God, it seems like it would be so much more efficient if God just let us just get, you know, let's get a couple of weeks worth and we could feel better about ourselves. Right? Lord, why do you make me go out every day and scoop this stuff off the ground? Let's, let's, let's store up some. It makes better sense. How many of you shop every day for groceries every day? Well, we don't do that because it's not efficient. But God's got something he's wanting to develop in these people. What is that? He wants them to learn to trust him. So that means that they've got to do exactly what he says today so they get their little container and they get it filled up and they feed their kids and their wife and stuff. And then all of a sudden it's gone by night. But they're going to put their trust in God because he said it's going to be enough tomorrow. God is saying to you people, listen, there's always going to be enough for tomorrow. So you see the principle of today right there? Yeah. Hmm. Go to the next screen. When Jesus is teaching his people to pray, this is what he says. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this week our... What's he doing? Why are we only to pray for today? Because God is trying to show us that's his will. That's the plan that he has for his people so that we walk in that constant trust in our Heavenly Father. There's something about storing up. I mean, when you've got a lot of stuff stored up, you go into relax mode, don't you? I mean, I can remember when we were first married, you know, we, sometimes it got a little lean, didn't it? Mac and cheese, baby, you know, that was three-course meal. But then time goes on, and all of a sudden you got this pantry full of good stuff, and your freezer's full, and, well, you know, you don't have to think much about it. 
And the tendency is for us to start relaxing in our trusting God and our looking to Him every day as our Jehovah Jireh, our supplier. God is saying to His people, learn to trust me today. Next screen. Lamentations chapter 3. We've heard it before, but I'm going to read it for you. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in Him. I wonder why His compassion, His mercies need to be new every morning. Because it gives you a clean slate every morning. You need a clean slate. Remember what you did yesterday? Mm. We don't want to think about that. So his mercy, his compassion, the newness of all that his covenant blessings have for you begin afresh today. And so today you walk in that thankfulness with the fruit of lips. Thank you, Father. I bless you for all the things that you're doing for me and my wife, for my children, my grandchildren, and my puppies. Right? People, today is your key. Today is your key. Next screen. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today... Is that what it says? Yes. Today. If you will hear his voice. If. You see that requirement there? There's a mandate there that you've got to do this. He's speaking, but you gotta, you, there's something for you to do. That's hearing. Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works 40 years. See, the sin of Israel was that they did not consistently trust God. They rejoiced, for example, when the water was gushing out of the flint rock. Can't you imagine the celebration that they had? But then just the next two or three days. Now, they've just left the oasis, okay? And now they're back in the desert. And about that time, you start getting thirsty, Your little ones are starting to grab because they're thirsty, and so you're starting to grumble against God, even though he's proven to you that he's willing and able to bring water out of nowhere. And he'll do it again and again and again, not just 1,500 years B.C., but in 2021 A.D. for you and me. God is in the business of taking care of his people so that you can take care of the kingdom here on the earth. And today is the key. Yesterday is gone and tomorrow may never come. Go to the next screen. Matthew chapter 6 verses 33 and 34. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. See there's your promise that he will always provide. I said there's your promise. And you've got a heavenly father that is, he can't even lie if he wanted to. So when he says it, it's it's true. But let's look at the rest of that. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. Why? Because tomorrow will worry about its own stuff. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. In other words, there's plenty for you to think about in any one day. Don't worry about tomorrow. Who holds tomorrow? Who is it? Tomorrow is his domain, not yours. And any time you and I try to get into his domain and do what he's supposed to be doing, everything gets messed up. Well, every one of us can write a verse to that song, can't we? We'll get these guys back on their guitars and we'll sing, you know, here's what I've done wrong, you know. Here's what I've done wrong song, you know. 
The conclusion is this, the victorious life begins with the mindset that today is the day that God has made. So let us rejoice and be glad in it. One day that settled in on me, it was probably a year or so ago, and I'd stopped into to Walmart to get something, and I was coming out, and I, was, I still was just rejoicing in my spirit mm -hmm. over the concept that God is just so good. Mm -hmm. And I guess I had this smile on my face or something. This guy walked by, and he looked at me and said, What are you, what are you looking at? What are you smiling about? So I, no, I didn't do that. <laughs> I didn't do that. <laughs> when it's right inside, it's going to come out, and you're going to, and you're going, to, they're going to see it on your face. God is good to us, perpetually, and He's good in a 24-hour time frame that you just rest in this 24-hour time frame, not yesterday, not tomorrow. This one. This is the day that God has apportioned to do his plan in your life. Hallelujah. Now, backward looking, let me just say this. Backward looking will displace what you need to do right now. Mm. Forward looking gets you into God's domain and you cannot do what he can do. So that is a futile, yeah. worthless effort. Yeah. So today, here's my promise to you as your pastor. Today, you will experience what God has apportioned for you. Amen. Can you say amen? Amen. amen? Bow your heads and let's pray. Lord, thank you for revelation truth. Thank you that you instruct us in the things of God that we don't have to wonder how to how to move forward and what to do because you are here with us your Holy Spirit guides us directs us teaches us this revelation of, the, of today Lord may it burn into us right now with a with a searing iron of truth on our hearts that we can learn to enjoy today, every day, with no fear, with no guilt or any problems of yesterday and trusting you for tomorrow. But we need your help. We are but dust. We make mistakes. We fall short of your glory. But you are always consistent there to be with us. You're the lifter of our heads and we're so thankful. Lord, may the strength and the power of this truth buoy us up and carry us forward as we move along in faith. And I'm going to thank you ahead of time for what you're going to do in the lives of each of these men and women. May their families be enhanced because of this truth. And as they go forward, I'm asking your blessings to be abundant upon them. And Lord, it's in the name of Jesus now I ask these things. And all the saints said, Amen. Amen. Stand up, if you would, please. That's enough for today. We're going to continue in our study on the Your Victorious Life next week.